Hello, hello. My name is Dr. Robin Lewis. I am a naturopathic physician practicing here in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And today I want to talk to you about something that is causing approximately 1 to 2 percent of you intermittent joint pain. This condition is also an autoimmune condition. And for those of you that don't know what an autoimmune condition is, it is simply when your immune system starts attacking tissues inside of your own body rather than foreign invaders like it should, such as colds and flus. If you haven't guessed it already, I'm talking about a condition called rheumatoid arthritis. This is a chronic autoimmune condition that attacks primarily the joints and it tends to get worse with time. So you'll notice joint swelling and joint redness and tenderness and things like that as the disease progresses. And it also creates whole body inflammation. Both the joints and the whole body inflammation can progress with time if you do not address it sooner rather than later. And so that is the point of today's video. But first, I want to just encourage all of you guys who have been listening for a while, if you want to support this channel and help me provide the content every single week that I do, I would highly recommend a like and subscribe so I can keep the good content coming. All right, but I digress. Today, more specifically, I want to talk to you about the triggers associated with rheumatoid arthritis. So we're always asking the question, why do these things develop in the first place? And while it's almost impossible to know for sure, there are some good studies showing some potential triggers or things that set off autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. And those are what I wanna to talk to you about today. Because if you can understand the triggers, then you can better manage your condition with or without medication, depending where you are. I really encourage you to pay attention to anything that you feel like might pertain to you because these are potential areas to explore with your healthcare practitioner. But before I go into the triggers, I need to first explain to you what are the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. So for those of you who don't yet know or have a diagnosis, you can better elicit whether or not you think you might have these things and whether or not to get worked up by your doctor. So for rheumatoid arthritis, this is talking about joint pain that has nothing to do with trauma. So what I mean by trauma is like rolling your ankle or injuring yourself on the soccer field or something like that. There's no incident that you can attribute to the pain inside of your joints. Typically it presents on both sides. So if you're going to have wrist pain, it's bilateral on both sides, but not always. And the main symptom is stiffness and achiness. As you are experiencing a flare, however, that pain goes way up, so it goes beyond just an achy pain to quite a severe pain, and you often will see significant swelling inside of the joint and tenderness. It can also get red and you can get joint deformities, but that is certainly more in the later stages of the condition. So if you're just starting to have joint pain, it probably won't present that severe, but definitely bilateral achiness. It tends to start in the wrist and the hands, but in my personal experience, that is very hit or miss. I've had a lot of patients where it presents first in places like the ankles and the knees. So take that with a little bit of a grain of salt, but definitely the most common areas to begin with can be the joints of the wrist and the hands. And the important thing to understand about rheumatoid arthritis is that if you don't address it, approximately 80% of people will go on to form really bad joint deformities later in life, and it can erode the joint itself. And rheumatoid arthritis does tend to pick up in progression in the first six years. So this is something that you want to have quickly diagnosed and quickly under control. So it doesn't even have an opportunity to progress to those later stages where the symptoms and the deformities are quite severe. But as I mentioned earlier, this is not exclusive to the joints. Autoimmune conditions will always have an overall body inflammation effect and in rheumatoid arthritis this is certainly the case those symptoms however are a little harder to pinpoint because they can be very generalized like things like 
weakness or fatigue or brain fog and things like that. Just low grade inflammation symptoms are usually what will present. And of course, as we know, fatigue can be related to a lot of different things. So those symptoms are certainly not super specific, but if you're getting the joint pain and excessive fatigue and maybe night sweats and things like that, you might be more likely to have rheumatoid arthritis. But like anything, nothing follows a textbook definition. So please, the ultimate way to have this confirmed is not through symptoms, it's actually through blood work. The thing that's really gonna confirm rheumatoid arthritis in your blood are the antibodies. So these are things that your immune system produces that will initiate an attack on a certain tissue or organism. So in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, you produce antibodies that will go on to attack or initiate an immune system response inside of the joints. And so these antibodies are anti-RF or anti-rheumatoid factor or anti-CCP. Those are the two most common antibodies. And so I encourage people to have both of those looked at because one can be negative and the other can be positive. So again, that's anti-RF or anti-CCP. Of course, they can always run other tests like inflammatory markers that just really assess how acute your flare is and how severe it is. Um, they can also do x-rays to assess the damage inside of the joints, but those are non-specific. The really telltale sign of whether or not it's rheumatoid arthritis versus other forms of arthritis is the antibodies. So those are absolutely crucial for this diagnosis and for fully understanding what's causing your joint pain. All right, now on to the fun stuff. If you've determined that you have rheumatoid arthritis, what is causing that rheumatoid arthritis or what's triggering it at the very least? It's very hard to say cause, but at least things that create flares or worsen the condition, potentially setting it off. The way I like to look at it is with any of these conditions, there's always a genetic predisposition, but then something in your environment needs to trigger it. And the interesting thing about this is the genetics are not as strong as you might think. So for example, if you have an identical twin, so someone who is very similar to you, um, your risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis, if they have it, is actually only 10 to 15%, and that's an identical twin. If we're talking about someone like a first degree relative, like a parent or a sibling, that risk is actually only two to 5%. So this is where we really get into the complexities of genetics and your environment. But the other thing to note when it comes to any autoimmune condition is if you have a relative with one type, you are still at more of a risk of developing any type of autoimmune condition. So what I mean by that is say your mother has Hashimoto's, which is a autoimmune condition of the thyroid. You are more likely to develop any type of autoimmune condition. So yes, certainly Hashimoto's, but potentially something like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or any of the other types. So ultimately it is important to know your family history because that can give you little clues and insights into what's causing your pain. It's also important to note that genetics available for rheumatoid arthritis are not well developed at this point. So it's not like something like a breast cancer gene where you can get tested for it at your doctor routinely. This is certainly not the case with rheumatoid arthritis. They do have about five or so genes that they think are strongly linked with rheumatoid arthritis, but they haven't really narrowed it down to one gene or they haven't come up with a test that really assesses genetic risk very well. So this is really something that you just have to look at your health history for. You can't really test for your genetic predisposition. The other things we're gonna talk about, however, like some of the potential triggers, you usually can test for them. So how can you have the genetics but not develop the condition? This is really where we get into something called epigenetics, which is super interesting. So this is essentially how we turn genes on and off. So just because you have the gene that puts you at a higher risk of developing the condition doesn't mean you will develop the condition if it does not get turned on. And epigenetics is affected by our environment. 
So our lifestyle habits, our stress, our exposures, they can turn genes on and off. And that is why I really like to emphasize to people that you do have a lot of power when it comes to your health. So a lot of people will take the bad attitude of, well, it runs in my family, so it's inevitable. No point in trying because my grandpa had this condition, my father had this condition, so what's the point? Well, that's super not true. We have so much control. Even if you have the bad luck of the draw of getting these genes, it does not mean you will develop those conditions. All right, up top, the first thing I need to talk about is the difference between genders because 75% of people who have rheumatoid arthritis are women. So this lends itself to the question, do hormones, especially sex-related hormones, create triggers for autoimmune conditions? Well, despite the fact that women are much more likely to develop this condition, when they look at the estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone levels of people with rheumatoid arthritis versus without, they actually don't find a massive difference. Of course, it's always good to keep your hormones balanced from an inflammatory standpoint and of overall well-being, but it doesn't really seem to be a trigger or something that is significantly different in people with rheumatoid arthritis. That being said, when they look at other things that trigger rheumatoid arthritis, there is, for whatever reason, a sex difference. So, for example, when they studied childhood trauma, they found that, yes, childhood trauma will increase your likelihood of developing rheumatoid arthritis, but more so in women. So that's super interesting. And they've also found when it comes to processing that trauma, people who dissociate from the trauma tend to also express more rheumatoid arthritis. So this really lends itself to the theory that trauma can get stored in the body and create autoimmune conditions. This again is just a theory at this point. I don't know if there's a ton of significant concrete evidence to prove that, but it's one of the working theories as to why women who maybe experience more trauma or just process trauma in a different way might be more likely to develop an autoimmune condition. But as far as the other avenues, as far as like sex hormone levels and stuff like that go, it doesn't really seem to make a massive difference. All right, the next one I wanna talk about is super interesting and in my opinion, it's one of the strongest arguments for triggering autoimmune conditions as a whole. And there's good evidence to support this when it comes to rheumatoid arthritis. And that is infections. So things like bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites. Infections tend to lead to autoimmune conditions. And I'm going to explain to you why. There's two working theories as to why an infection would lead to something like an autoimmune condition. The first one is called molecular mimicry. So your T cells, which are a part of your immune system that regulate autoimmune conditions, they are getting activated because there are components of these infections that look similar to the antigens of these certain tissues. So you're getting a cross reactivity. There's a part of the bacterial cell wall, for example, that looks similar to your joint tissue and now your immune system is mounting an attack on both because it's a little bit confused and can't really tell the difference. The next working theory is called bystander activation, which essentially says there's something in your environment that's creating a lot of inflammation, like a chronic infection, and as a byproduct of that, your T cells are just so overactive that they will also start attacking your tissues. So it's kind of like an overwhelm of the immune system. It's so burdened and bogged down by continually trying to fight this infection that you're getting kind of collateral damage and dysregulation inside of the immune system. Now, I don't say this to scare you. Do know that I'm talking about chronic infections. So yes, something like an acute infection can create a flare in your symptoms. So say you're fighting like a cold or flu, you might notice a worsening of your joint pain, but I'm really talking about chronic infections that lie inside of the body for a long period of time. So these are things like Lyme disease. These are things like chronic Epstein-Barr dysfunctions and imbalances to your gut microbiome, your oral microbiome, all of these things relate to each other. 
The problem with a lot of these chronic infections are is you don't often know that you have them because it's not the same thing as an acute infection. So acute infections are a little bit more obvious. You're getting a big flare of symptoms like a high fever, maybe nausea, a cough, something that you can kind of pinpoint to something infectious. Chronic infections can create a lot more low-grade symptoms like fatigue, low-grade fever, peculiar symptoms here and there, flares to your autoimmune condition. So chronic infections can be hard to identify. A lot of people are unaware of the fact that they even have these chronic infections. I'm gonna give you a real life example of one of my patients. So her autoimmune condition, through a lot of work on her end, ended up being actually a product of infections inside of her mouth from an oral surgery that had happened many, many years ago. So there were pockets inside of her mouth that were just breeding these bad bacteria. And that was creating a lot of burden on the immune system. She was not aware of this because it wasn't red, hot, swollen, painful type of infection. It was a low grade chronic infection deep inside of her mouth that she was completely unaware of until she visited a biological dentist who identified it, cleared it, and her autoimmune symptoms almost immediately resolved. That did not completely cure her. It was one of the main reasons she believed she developed an autoimmune condition in the first place. So chronic infections are certainly very relevant and it's not always as straightforward as you might think. But luckily there are great tests out there now that you can actually investigate this. So a lot of private labs will look at these chronic infections now. There are assessments you can do through the stool that look at your gut microbiome. There are actions you can take based on what pops up. So this is a very treatable thing if you do find out that you are suffering from any sort of chronic infection, microbiome disturbances, or anything along those lines. Similar to infections, toxins in our environment can also create a massive burden on the immune system, create a lot of confusion, and really worsen the severity of someone's rheumatoid arthritis. When they've studied this, they have found a whole wide variety of different toxins can worsen someone's rheumatoid arthritis. So this includes things like heavy metals, silica dust, which is in a lot of construction. They've looked at smoking, cigarette smoking. There's lots of different things that we're exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis that can create toxicity inside of the body. Now, that being said, we are also able to flush out toxins. So it's not like everything coming in stores. We do have a liver, a kidney, a lot of detox systems to get rid of these things. But if your burden is high, so say you're working in an environment where you're exposed to a high level of toxins, or if your capacity to get rid of these toxins, so for example, liver disease, nutritional deficiencies, stuff like that, if those um, elimination routes are dampened as well, this is when you start to lead into chronic toxicity symptoms and immune system confusion. So for example, heavy metals that have been linked to rheumatoid arthritis include things like mercury, lead, nickel, and cadmium. And cadmium, for example, makes a lot of sense because cadmium, when it's too high in the body, will affect your calcium metabolism. So that's gonna affect your bones and it's also toxic to the immune system itself. So it's gonna create an immune system issue and a bone issue, both of which are highly linked to something like rheumatoid arthritis. And the other bit of good news, similar to the infections, is you can test for these things. They're often done in specialized labs, again, through things like the urine or things like stool or blood, um, but you can test for them and there are therapies that are targeted towards whatever sort of toxicity you've built up inside of your body. So very actionable, but something definitely worth looking into. All right, guys, we're getting there. I know this is a longer episode, but there's just so much I wanna to talk to you about, and I'm never gonna cover it all, but here is at least the bare minimum I can feel good about myself providing. The next one we're gonna talk about is mitochondrial dysfunction. So this can actually be very related to the first two infections and toxins because those can beat up your mitochondria. But first, let me clarify what your mitochondria is and why it can lead 
to things like autoimmune conditions and flares in autoimmune conditions. So your mitochondria are the part of your cells that produce energy. They're commonly called the powerhouse of the cell. They are very, very important for almost all cellular functions, and they can get beat up with time through things like infection and toxins, but also through things like medications, poor nutrition, oxidative stress. So there's lots of different things that can damage your mitochondria. And the reason this can worsen someone's autoimmune condition is based off of two main things. First up is the role of the mitochondria, which is energy production, which is important for everything to function better. It also has a massive role in immune system regulation. Second is the fact that the accumulation of really defective mitochondria actually can create a really large inflammatory response in the body. So if we have a buildup of damaged mitochondria, that's going to increase our inflammation and increased inflammation is not good for autoimmune conditions. The next one I wanna talk about is something very unique that often gets missed in these videos and that is methylation. So poor methylators, which is something that you can test for through generic genetic tests like 23andMe, poor methylators are people who can't activate certain vitamins, they have sluggish metabolism inside of the liver, they will have a higher predisposition to things like allergies, mood disorders. Methylation is like a sneaky source of a lot of people's health concerns, and it is something that is very easily treated through things like methylated B vitamins, something called SAM-E. So there is certainly a lot of room for exploration when it comes to methylation. I by no means think it's one of the most common causes of autoimmune flares, um, but it's definitely relevant in a very small percentage of the population and worth looking into with your doctor. Lastly, I wanna to talk to you guys about mental health and its relation to rheumatoid arthritis. To be honest, there's not enough research as to why these might be flares and triggers, but as I mentioned earlier, they're starting to pick out little things inside of the research that link mental health to autoimmune conditions, like the trauma example I gave earlier. But the more obvious thing that is definitely well studied, definitely a trigger, is stress. So high stress in the body creates inflammation, it creates nervous system dysregulation, it actually dampens your immune system response and your immune system function. So getting a hold of your mental health is very important. If for nothing else, dealing with an autoimmune condition can be very hard on the psyche. So at the very least, it's important to address that. So you're in a good mental place for the challenges that come along with autoimmune conditions and we know mental health and things like stress and trauma affect our epigenetics so it certainly is plausible that it is creating a trigger for things like autoimmune condition or a more aggressive expression of that rheumatoid arthritis all right so i know that was a really long episode so i'm going to wrap up real quick for you guys i hope that this really helped you understand how taking a more holistic look at something like an autoimmune condition can be incredibly helpful areas you can start to think about are worth investigating if you think that might be relevant to you do you have infectious exposures toxin exposures is your mental health doing well all of these things are different areas to explore with your healthcare provider, and they really can be helpful in managing something like an autoimmune condition, lowering medications, which have side effects, are necessary in some cases, but certainly can be lowered if you're getting control of these other factors. These are all things I want you to think about. I hope you found today's episode very helpful. If there's anything else that you'd like me to dive into, please comment below. And if you like this content, again, please like and subscribe so I can keep the good content coming. Have a great week, you guys.